Russia prepares to welcome North Korean leader Kim Jong-un for the first time. Kim is on his way to Vladivostok for a summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. South Korea and the US will be monitoring developments intently. High drama at South Korea's National Assembly, the ruling Democratic Party and three minor opposition parties ratify a deal to fast track a set of election and reform bills. The main opposition party is furious and is threatening a boycott. Plus, the South Korean government will discuss the details of a 5.8 billion US dollar supplementary budget aimed in part at improving air quality in the country. So our top story this morning, the South Korean government has been reviewing the details of a multi-billion dollar supplementary budget bill. At a cabinet meeting this morning, the government poured over the bill worth 5.8 billion US dollars, which will be submitted to the National Assembly on Thursday. If approved, the extra funds could provide recovery momentum in the second half of the year and boost economic growth by one-tenth of a percentage point. The budget is set to be allocated to resolve domestic issues like recovering from the wildfire in Kangwondo province and installing air quality management systems to tackle the fine dust crisis. President Moon Jae-in had previously called on his government to secure funding to enhance public safety and the National Disaster Management System and reflecting that in the supplementary budget. Let's turn to the drama at South Korea's National Assembly now and even by its own standards, Tuesday was quite the eventful day. The main opposition party is up in arms threatening to boycott all parliamentary activity after the ruling party and three minor parties secured enough support among their own lawmakers to fast track some contentious reform bills. Our Kim Min-ji with the details. A package of reform bills is on course to being fast tracked. This after the ruling Democratic Party and three minor opposition parties formally confirmed their lawmakers support for the move on Tuesday. The fast-track measure allows bills to be put off for a full-floor vote even if they haven't been approved by the relevant committees after 330 days. The bills in question include one on electoral reform. It calls for the number of parliamentary seats to stay at 300, but proportional representation seats would be increased to 75 from the current 47. The other bill seeks the creation of a body that will be able to investigate high-ranking government and public officials. The votes to fast-track them are expected to take place on Thursday at the Special Parliamentary Committees on Political and Judiciary Reform. Of the 18 lawmakers on each panel, three-fifths or 11 of them will need to vote in favor. The four parties have met the three-fifths threshold in theory, but there are some in the Padamita party who are holding out. On top of that, the main opposition Liberty Korea party has pledged strong resistance. They see the new system in the electoral reform bill as against their political interests. The Conservatives plan to hold a major protest in central Seoul this weekend and have warned of a total boycott of Parliament. Their resistance will make it harder for the ruling party to pass the pile of bills needed to get the Moon Jae administration's agenda moving and to deliberate on the government's extra budget proposal. While the four parties have said they will try harder to persuade the main opposition party to come around, it seems unlikely Parliament will get back to normal anytime soon. Kim min Arirang News. Now, we have confirmation of some of the details of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. As many had expected, it will take place on Thursday, April 25th, in Vladivostok. For more, let's connect to our E.G. Won, who's on the phone for us. So, Ji Won, give us the details. Mark, the Kremlin has officially confirmed when and where Kim Jong-un will be meeting with Vladimir Putin. Like you said, uh, Reuters reported that Russia's presidential aide Yuri Ushakov told reporters Tuesday that the summit will be held in Vladivostok on Thursday. Their meeting will start with a one-on-one -on -one sit-down, followed by an expanded talk between the respective delegations, which will not result in the leaders signing any agreements or making a joint statement. Ushakov also said the discussions on the political and diplomatic solution regarding the denuclearization of the Korean peninsula would be the main focus of their meeting. He also explained that Putin would try to set the tone for, quote, achieving serious agreements for uh, settling the problem of the Korean peninsula. 
Now, while the specific venue has not yet been disclosed, various reports suggest the first Pyongyang-Moscow summit in eight years will take place at the Far Eastern Federal University, located on Rusky Island off the coast of Vladivostok. NK News reports that preparations are underway there with the flags of North Korea and Russia lined up at one of the buildings. And uh, Jiwon, we also hear that the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is already on his way and he's traveling to Russia in his uh, heavily fortified train. Yes, Mark, the North Korean Central News Agency reported earlier today that Kim had left for Russia on his train early this morning. The report listed the delegates accompanying Kim, including Pyongyang's top diplomat Lee Yong ho Vice Foreign Minister Che sun as well as Oh Su-yong, chairman of the regime's budget committee. Now, one thing to notice here is that we did not see Kim Young-chul, vice chairman of the ruling Workers' Party Central Committee, and Kim Jong-un's wife, Lee seok ju on the list. Now, Russia's local media reports that uh, Kim is expected to arrive in Vladivostok between 4 and 5 p.m. today, which would be 3 to 4 p.m. for us here in Korea. Now, according to Russian and Japanese media, Kim will tour around places that his father had visited eight years ago and possibly visit the world-renowned Marinsky Theater, a public aquarium, and Russia's Pacific Fleet, Fleet headquarters. He's then expected to head back home on Friday. Now, meanwhile, preparations seem to be still underway as a plane that departed from Pyongyang last night arrived in Vladivostok very early this morning. The specially scheduled flight is seen to have uh, probably carried personnel and supplies for the summit. Back to you, Mark. Okay, Jiwon, thank you very much for that report. Now, the U.S. State Department has once again highlighting the final fully, fully verified denuclearization of North Korea is the international community's common goal. When South Korea's Yonhap News Agency asked about Washington's response to the upcoming summit between the leaders of North Korea and Russia, an official said Washington is keeping an eye on related reports. The official also said the U.S. will continue dialogue with Moscow to bridge any gaps that may hinder the two countries' ability to move forward. The Hanoi summit ended with no agreement and now North Korea is seeking to forge ties with another of the world's superpowers, Russia. So how should we see this and what direction might the two sides take? To discuss this, scores of experts from around the world gathered in Seoul on Tuesday for an annual diplomacy focus forum. Our Oh Jung-hee went to check it out and filed this report. International experts analyze that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, through his summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin, wants to relieve the regime's political isolation and economic difficulties while pressing the U.S. Russia, on the other hand, wants to show that it's still an influential player in the region. But Moscow won't cause a dramatic turnaround, and there's a limit to what Russia can offer to Pyongyang, a former U.S. deputy national security advisor says. I would be surprised if Russia dramatically broke with the UN sanctions, for example, or really took a, 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 a very significant new turn in its direction. I think it's a, simply a reminder uh, to everyone that Russia is still a player in um, East Asia. Pundits say the upcoming Pyongyang-Moscow summit is one of many tactics North Korea can use to gain the upper hand when it comes to nuclear negotiations. And so is the North's recent criticism on high-ranking U.S. officials like Pompeo and Bolton. Pyongyang wants to deal directly with U.S. President Trump. You still try to deal with Trump because the rest of the administration, Bolton, Pompeo, everybody else, is just going to be even worse. So I think he's still more willing than people like Bolton to, if there is a decent deal to be had. South Korea has stated that the two sides should come up with a, quote, good enough deal instead of the so-called big deals or small deals. A former U.S. ambassador to South Korea says this good enough deal would have to involve some real actions that lessen threats on the peninsula. To actually begin to dismantle and destroy some of the weapons that threaten, North, uh, threaten South Korea, threaten the United States, uh, as the kind of litmus test of seriousness of Kim Jong-un. Real steps in that direction for me would be enough to offer some limited reduction in the sanctions. 
And moving forward, analysts agree that having another inter-Korean summit wouldn't help much in providing a momentum to nuclear negotiations. The prospect is also grim for a third summit between Kim and Trump, as neither Pyongyang nor Washington has moved an inch from their respective stances. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Now, after holding his summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, Russian President Vladimir Putin is set for a summit with China's Xi Jinping in Beijing on Friday. One of Putin's aides said Tuesday that the two leaders will discuss the pairing of the Eurasian Economic Union and the Silk Road Economic Belt. Other points on the agenda include cooperation on political trade, economic and humanitarian issues. Russia and China also celebrate the 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations this year, with President Xi set to make a state visit to Russia in June. Now, military tensions between the two Koreas have abated ever since Seoul and Pyongyang held the first Moon Kim summit in Panmunjom almost a year ago to this day. Now, Kim Jion takes a look at the progress and the setbacks that have been seen over the past 12 months. A lot has changed since the leaders of the two Koreas have met on April 27, 2018, to engage in peace talks which laid the foundation for their comprehensive military agreement, which was signed at the second summit by the two countries on September 19. It included the trial removal of nearly a dozen frontline guard posts on both sides of the demilitarized zone, as well as the removal of weaponry and troops there, following trilateral military talks held with the United Nations Command in October last year. Since the inter-Korean military agreement, the two Koreas have also disarmed the Joint Security Area in Panmunjom and set up ground, air and maritime buffer zones along the inter-Korean border. A no-fly zone has been imposed covering 10 to 40 kilometers from the military demarcation line, and Seoul's defense ministry has been trying to negotiate with the North about expanding the zone to cover the Hangang River estuary. The two Koreas have also carried out a joint survey of the estuary's waterway with the aim of providing free passage of civilian vessels by sharing the area. They have also conducted demining operations at Arrowhead Ridge inside the DMZ, site to one of the fiercest battles during the Korean War for the excavation of troop remains. Despite this, the two Koreas still have a long way to go to fully implement the agreement amid deepening concerns over Pyongyang's increasingly lukewarm attitude amid a lack of progress in denuclearization talks with the U.S. Further discussions include North Korea's acknowledgement of the Northern Limit Line, the disputed maritime demarcation line in the West Sea, where the Koreas have agreed to establish a shared fishing ground. They also need to hold more talks on the joint excavation of war remains, currently being carried out solely by the South after the North failed to respond. Kim Jian, Arirang News. Now, the death toll from the dreadful terror attack in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday continues to rise with more than 300 people confirmed as dead as of now. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Hong Yu. So the Sri Lankan government we hear is now saying the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility. What are we hearing in regards to that? Well, as you said, Mark, the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the series of coordinated bombings at churches and high-end hotels across Sri Lanka, but they did not provide any evidence to back up their claim. IS made the announcement through a statement in its Amak News Agency on Tuesday, which identified seven suicide bombers that had detonated explosive-laden vests at the eight locations where the bombings occurred. The Sri Lankan Prime Minister acknowledged the claim during a press briefing in the country's capital, Colombo. Let's take a look. We, certainly the security apparatus of the view, that there are, there are foreign links and some of the evidence uh, points to that. So if uh, when the uh, ISIS claimed it, we'll be following up on this claim. There was suspicion that there were links with the ISIS. That the investigators are making good progress in regard to uh, identifying the uh, culprits. 
but it means that we have to identify all the culprits and look at what the network is. According to multiple U.S. intelligence agencies, ISIS is believed to have been involved in the Sri Lanka attack by helping the radical Muslim group nations Tawahi Jaman. The involvement of a foreign organization would explain how a previously marginal domestic extremist group could have been capable of committing such a sophisticated and coordinated attack. U.S. President Donald Trump has tweeted more than 50 times in 24 hours, demanding an apology from the New York Times, complaining that he doesn't get enough credit for the booming U.S. economy. After the release of the Mueller report, the media became the primary target of Trump's tweets as he complained that he's the subject to an unprecedented level of press scrutiny, with extra vitriol saved for the New York Times, CNN and MSNBC. The Grand Duke Zhang of Luxembourg, who oversaw the transformation of the Grand Duchy into an international financial center, has died at the age of 98. He had recently been admitted to hospital suffering from a pulmonary infection and passed away surrounded by his family, according to his son, Angri. Grand Duke Zhang greatly contributed to turning Luxembourg from an industrial backwater into a center for financial services and satellite communications during his 36 years as the head of the state. He stepped down as Grand Duke in the year 2000. Time now for our Life and Info segment where we focus on information that we hope will be useful for your everyday life. Today we are going to focus on medical tourism here in South Korea. That's because hundreds of thousands of foreign visitors come here every year for medical treatment of various sorts. The number hit a record high last year with Seoul the most visited destination. I'm happy to say we have our Che Xiang in the studio to tell us more. So Xi Hyung, a record number. What, what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, Mark, last year, the number, it reached almost 400,000. Now, medical tourism uh, refers to people traveling to a country um, other than their own to get medical treatment. Now, ever since 2009, when hospitals in South Korea were first allowed to admit foreign patients, the number of international medical tourists flowing, flowing in every year has been on the rise. Now, since 2009, almost 3 million foreigners have come here for medical treatment. So, almost 400,000, by my reckoning, that's an average of around 7,500 people coming here every single week. That's a lot of planes full of people looking for medical uh, treatment. And I hear that they come from all four corners of the world as well. That's right, Mark. Um, so out of roughly 400,000 uh, visitors that came to South Korea last year, almost a third came from China, um, followed by the United States, Japan, and Russia. Now, other Asian countries, such as Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and Thailand, were next in line. Now, as you mentioned, unsur unsurprisingly, the majority of these tourists came to Seoul to get medical care. More than six out of 10 medical tourists who came to Korea last year chose the capital as their destination. Gangnam is the most visited district in Seoul because it's packed with highly high quality hospitals authorized to treat foreign patients. Yes, and they publicize their services a lot overseas as well. And as I'm sure our uh, viewers in Korea know that Gangnam really is the mecca for plastic surgery here in the country. So is plastic surgery the main reason why people are coming to South Korea for this medical treatment? Yes, that is true. Um, they're mostly seeking beauty-related medical treatment, um, such as plastic surgery um, or dermatology, uh, skin care. Now, that's, uh, it's true that though that internal medicine is what most people came for, but this is rather a set of specialized departments combining branches that deal with infectious diseases, respiratory diseases, digestive system, etc. Okay, so what you're saying is that not everyone is coming uh, to get plastic surgery done. That's a common misconception among some people. There are uh, 
people coming from less developed parts mm -hmm. of the world yeah. to get the best treatment they mm -hmm. can for a reasonable price here in South Korea. You mentioned that some of these medical tourists actually come as far away as the United States. So what's attracting them to make the 12 hour flight across the Pacific Ocean to come to Korea to get this kind of treatment? Well, Mike, I was asking the very same question to myself, and, but I think there's no single clear-cut answer to the question. So I want to just share with you uh, what I heard during my mm. chat with a plastic surgeon and his patient. Now, I think this might give you some clues. These days, we do minimally invasive plastic surgery, which involves newer technologies such as laser therapy or threads. Patients benefit from quicker recovery times and less scarring. I heard that South Korea is world famous for its high-tech plastic surgery. My closest acquaintances told me the same thing. So rather than seeking plastic surgeons in my own country, I came to South Korea to get the surgery you want. So to borrow their words, I think South Korea's up-to-date surgical procedures may be one of the charms attracting foreign choice. Now, of course, the price may also be a factor, but considering tourists are paying for their flight and accommodation, aside from the medical bills, it isn't really that cheap. Uh, why don't you take a listen to what some beauty specialists have to say about South Korea's success? South Korea is one of only a few countries where highly trained medical specialists are extensively operating on beauty-related procedures. So South Korea has the latest technology and a great pool of highly trained medical specialists just dedicated to enhancing beauty, whether they may be plastic surgeons or dermatologists. And experts went on to say that people in South Korea are so passionate about beauty regardless of age. So medical specialists here are dealing with more beauty boost pr procedures than their peers elsewhere in the world. And now that further sharpens their skills. OK, well, looking at the video while you're talking, uh, Xiong, not everyone can be as uh, good looking as you, of course, uh, even uh, with surgery. But uh, uh, some of our viewers might be interested in knowing uh, how they can find about uh, more information about these plastic surgeries and medical centers that are located in the Kangnam area, because that's where the vast concentration are. In fact, uh, the Kangnam Medical Tour Center, um, they, it recommends hospitals. It helps visitors to choose medical centers by different medical departments from plastic surgery, uh, dermatology, to even neurosurgery. Now, visitors can also get some help to find a suitable accommodation. Now, if you cannot make it to the center, that's fine. You can just visit the center's website, which is offered in six different languages, and search for recommended hospitals or accommodation by yourself. Now, if you have questions, give them a call or send an email. And if you're really more of a social media lover, just go on to the center's Facebook and Weibo accounts or mobile messenger online listed on the website. Well, Xiong, thank you very much for your report. It was a pleasure as always, and thanks for putting that together for us. Thanks for having me, Mark. Good morning. Some welcome rain fell in most parts. It helped to wash away the dust and relieve the dryness in the air. Well, most showers should stop by noon, so a small umbrella should be good enough. But for those of you in southern inland regions, you could see more rain until the mid-afternoon, while eastern regions are forecast to get rain tonight. Now, before it lets up, most western regions could see light sprinkles of less than 5 millimeters. the east a bit more, but expect another band of rain tomorrow, and central regions will see heavier showers than we did on Tuesday. Temperatures will not be affected by today's showers, but tomorrow's rain will surely drag down the mercury. So expect a big drop in temperature readings by the end of the week. It's going to be a warm afternoon for Seoul today, reaching up to 26 degrees Celsius, while the rest will also see highs in the 20s this afternoon. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, that's all the news and weather we have for now on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. Stay tuned to Adidang TV. And a reminder that we have our next newscast is coming up at noon, Korea time with our very own E.G. Yoon. So until then, goodbye. Daily news you need to know. Breathing life into stories. Be implemented.